Yeah, bugger off, Tom. There's an American, there's another American with us. <laughs> Ooh, there you go. Um, today uh, we're talking about uh, Pictish stones and I thought I'd start it off with um, just a, a picture of uh, what someone thinks a Pictish person would look like. I've seen loads of different um, recreations um, and they've all been very interesting. Um, That's me in the garden in the summer in hot weather. <laughs> Off, oh, it, it's me on a night out, Del, if, if I <laughs> could at the moment. <laughs> um, but I think it's a very interesting um, topic to talk about. Um, my little sisters are half Scottish, so we used to spend a lot of time up Scotland, and I love the history there, and the landscape is beautiful. So it was nice to uh, touch upon this, really. And um, it's going along with that theme that we're still having of the early medieval period um, is a period that's, uh, I, I, well, they call it the Dark Ages, but it's a period of illumination. And the Picts, I feel like, have taken illumination, but put it in their own way. Um, and we see that with their stones, and that's something that we're going to get into. And I think it, it's a very interesting um, topic to look at. Um, sorry, I've got my notes by here, but it's uh, currently charging. Um, but I thought I'd introduce them first, get to know the people um, before we start talking about um, the stones, really. And the Picts were a group of uh, Kel Kel Celtic speaking people who lived uh, in what is known now as um, Northern and Eastern Scotland. Um, and it was during the late antiquity to the early medieval period. And they lived in, uh, they lived um, in in this amazing landscape and they were able to produce these amazing pieces of artwork i feel like that told us a story of their people and their life um, and i think it even told us more about um possibly the status and the tribes that they had as well and the um the, the name that they're given is um a name that they possibly wouldn't have associated with themselves either um and i think that's one thing that people need to uh, take away sometimes from history is that the names that we can have of people in uh, periods like this for example um carl's given us great examples in his uh, new book for example the druids is that there's always been something talked about the Druids and I remember being in uh, primary school and going on about the Druids but there's nothing directly telling us about the Druids um, and so the Picts were names given um, a nickname really given by the Romans and so we don't really know what they would have identified themselves as but we know how they were able to show off their identity um, in terms of their metalwork, in terms of their stonework and um, the legacy they've left behind in Scotland. And Scotland have really gone hard into preserving the archaeology and the history of these people because I think it's important to their heritage and their approach to it is, is amazing and I think it's something that maybe Wales needs to take a, a note of in terms of that as well. But a lot of um, classical authors have talked about them as well, have given them this nickname. And it's um, from the fourth century AD, these people uh, were referred to as Picts. And they had, um, they've had a, a long history um, and they've interacted with so many different civilizations and cultures and they've still remained strong. And I think they've given us this sense of magic as well in terms of their stonework, in terms of their history. And I think um, things like that are very prone to uh, legends as well, um, which is what I found with a lot of uh, reading of this. But they were regarded as savage warriors, um, but by the time the Norsemen were um, compiling their sagas and their histories, the memory of the Picts had uh, um, sort of disintegrated into these sort of magical race of theories really this is something that I've read on uh, the orkneyjar.com and there has been a lot of theories uh, about how they lived and what they believed and definitely one thing that is allowing us to get one step closer is their um their amazing stones and I think there's just a cloud of uncertainty because there's no, writ no written records left behind, but I think they didn't have the 
sort of written records that we had, they have their own way of communicating. And I think that's something you've got to be very open minded about when talking about them. But one thing is, is that the indigenous group of people in Scotland from the Iron Age and um, they're very significant, I think, in terms of uh, Scotland's history in telling us um, how Scotland was living right to the early medieval periods and how they ended up um, going into Christianity as well. And there's lots of historical writers that have recorded them and a lot of them have been very biased, maybe over exaggerated on how awful they were and I'm saying that because I, I don't think uh, I feel like when it's a very different type of living um especially with people in Wales etc when there's a different type of living um to what people are used to and they tend to go to uh, this um Norman belief of history after 1066 they tend to look at people before that time as being very backwards very savage very barbaric and I think that's very um, it's not fair, it's, it's almost um, disregarding their history and what they have to say and what they're trying to tell us as well. And I think what we're finding of them, because we're finding a lot of discoveries recently um, that have given us one step closer to who they are. And um, they, 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 the, the earliest survivor mention of them have dated from 297 AD in a poem praising the Roman Emperor um, Constantius um, Clorius, um, who wrote that the Britons were already accustomed to the semi-naked picti and um, as their enemies. And the, the, the scene is that someone is a group of people that are very negative and uh, seem to be enemies as well, of uh, almost like enemies from progressing further but this is our history and it's something that's different you look at people all around the world and you see that they all have different ways of living and different types of identity and different ways of recording their history and I think people of Scotland, Wales, Ireland all need to have that respect as well in terms of they're, they're different but there's nothing wrong with being different because it's just how they see the world and um, like I said this is a nickname that the, the that Picti, um, a Roman nickname used to describe people north of Hadrian's Wall. And it's, it's, it's a term used, it's, it's the same as saying European, which is used to describe a number of people in countries. I think it's a blanket term. It doesn't really sort of specify on who they are. A lot of people have uh, called them the painted people as well. And this is um, due to referring to their customs of tattooing their bodies or um, embellishing themselves in war paint. And um, this, is, this is an adaptation of um, how they were able to show their identity. And it's still something that we see to this day. People express themselves in the way they look and the way they look and mean completely different things. And you, de you definitely see that because um, I always like to sort of do something quite little with uh, my jewellery. I always have uh, little things that mean things to me. For example, I have a ring that says, be yourself. And I've got um, a little serpent ring and they all mean different things to me. And I've even put on um, different types of jewellery. And you see that with people wearing crosses and people dress different ways. So that's what I'm trying to say is that clothing and the way they present themselves on the outside is their identity as well. But um, this is a nation of, uh, is said to make, be made up of several um, federations that had their own leaders. And um, Orkney for um, part of the time was thought to be the Pictish kingdom, um, which had its own ruler. Um, and we're definitely seeing a lot of evidence coming from them as well. But um, it seems like um, the allegiance to Orkney as being maybe the centre of it all is, is, is debated. And um, a lot of people seem to think that this is just um, a bit like the Maltry people, where they all have a shared culture, but they have their own way of um, dealing with their communities. But... Um, quite recently, um, we're finding a lot of evidence. So uh, one of them is to, from um, Orkney, and this is what you're seeing here. They're in Orkney, um, they've had this um, erosion going on, and they're starting to see these stones, stones 
coming up with carvings on them. And no one really knows really what these stones mean or their significance or why they were put up. But a lot of theories are being brought together and um, with the evidence put together, you can definitely start to go down one route or another. Um, some scholars are saying that they're territorial markers and some are saying that they commemorated great people or events. And I will take you down a few of these views showing a few of these stones, but I don't see why there has to be at least one. It could be a number of things. Like I said, people have always been interested in documenting their history and their people. So I think this is a way of doing it. And it's been suggested that um, these symbols can also mean things about the individual, um, about the community, um, about treaties. Um, so th they believe that this is sort of representing the Pictish way of life. And this is also something that you see in, um, in Orkney as well, is um, this other stone. And you start to see that there's evidence of not just Pictish symbols, but also uh, crosses as well. And this is when you start to see them um, go in further into Christianity. But we've spent two weeks uh, ago when a couple of weeks before that looking at the early medieval period and um, these stones are providing a, chronology, a chronological, um, chronological sort of timeline of the vast changes in the culture of Scotland and I think that's very important because um, even though we don't know everything about them we're able to uh, come to a conclusion of how we're seeing the culture of Scotland change and they're said to be the earliest one that we know of is said to be from the 300s AD and the latest ones from the 900s AD but these are showing a lot of graphic descriptions of lives and symbols of the Pictish people and by the 600s you're starting to see the imposing of Christianity in these stones like the one that we're seeing here and slowly Christianity is having this upper hand um, over the Pictish way of life and their symbolism and end up being solely about the Christianity. But on the reverse side, the Pictish people still want to be true to their origins and who they are. They have sort of put their symbolism on the back. But I think this is a different time and sense of place and it, it links to, to us really um, what is going on and um, all the different things they, they're interacting with loads of different people they're seeing loads of different battles they're they're even um putting down their own um stories on it so i think that's very important but th this idea of erosion is something that i'm talking with saint mary's well bay is that sometimes erosion um of coasts can be very um frustrating because you're losing the archaeology but sometimes you can find some archaeology as well and this is what has happened with Orkney is that you're starting to see stones like this and you're seeing these designs on them and that they're, they're absolutely beautiful and they, they, there's loads of um, different types of ones and they all depict different types of animals and one of them is that salmon, deer, bull, um, birds such as eagles um, and you've got such things as monsters so beasts and mythical creatures you also get to see a v rods combs and mirrors and even double discs in there so you've seen a lot of symbolism that can mean a lot of different things but they're believing that this is um perhaps based on the, also the tattoos that the Pictish tribes would use to decorate their bodies. Is they, These symbols are important to them and communicating with each other because they would know. Um, and I think that that's one thing I feel like we'll never truly know what they are because the people who did know are, are lost to time. And um, it, it is a shame. But when you start to see things um, like the indigenous Australians who say that you can't read our cave paintings because we know about it and we know as each tribe what each uh, our own tribe means in our symbolism I think that's what I'm gathering here as well and um, that we'll never know and sadly is lost time because uh, these people have obviously um, mixed into um, society that is today but a lot of people have discussed whether they had magical properties, whether they had um, anything to do with religion or beliefs, um, but I definitely think they want to show us what's important in their life as well. And there's a handful of stones that are being found in 
Orkney and what they're saying is that we're having um, a lot of evidence coming forward of these stones and um, it seems like there should there is one being found nearly every year and the most recent one at the moment is from 2019 and it's been displayed in a museum in December 2020 but obviously due to Covid is something that people haven't had the pleasure of seeing hopefully now that they can um, but it, it's been something that people have been observing online and it has been truly magical and these stones I think that they're just even more amazing and this one is um, displayed in an Elgin uh, museum and it's a big stone and it's quite unusual because of uh, you've seen all these different carvings um, and you can't really see quite well here um, but on the top here it was almost like there's an eagle um, going on and you then see here there's like a a Z rod going that way um, and going that way as well and you've got all these different types of patterns going down here and swirls and they, honestly I think they're beautiful to look at um, and amazing to, to look at as well and sort of observe and um, I think you could have hours and hours sort of discussing at least one stone um, but the, these stones that, that they get found due to ploughing, for example, um, due to people finding it by accident. Um, and the carvings um, include large, this one, a large eagle on the top. And they, that's a typical Pictish symbol. And um, the archaeologists are discussing on what they mean, but to find them, they seem to be very rare and once in a lifetime finds even though we're finding one every year I think if you had one archaeologist per um, stone finding it would be a once in a lifetime opportunity and this is said to be about 8th to the 9th uh, century and um, something that has been truly treasured and this is said to be um, nearly two meters high and it was named um, after where it was found in Moray and um, and you're seeing a lot of this in um, Aberdeenshire as well, for example, and you start to see a lot of different types of markings. And a lot of archaeologists believe that these symbols um, tend to be meaning something in terms of their tribe. Now, I think that maybe possibly the eagle is possibly a sense of um, power. It's a very powerful bird, and I think they're just trying to show their identity of how powerful they were as a tribe or possibly the person that is um, controlling the tribe as well. And you, you start to see all different types of uh, ones coming forward with um, different meanings and I think one thing that will go further with it is that just like the Pictish people like to be colourful in the way they looked I think um, they've done this with their metalwork and they're definitely going to do it with this um, and this stone that we're looking at you can see the white marks on it that is just from where um, this was done at a land uh, where they were planning to build houses um, and it was tossed by a JCB um, hence the white marks but this was found by a metal detector at enthusiast as well he, he, he possibly could have been should have been in the area maybe but he come across this and he had to make um it known and it was found in um february 2019 and it gives us a sense of origins i think in a way but i think it also shows us that each territory territory has its own symbols and that's why i, I wanted to have a look at um, the eagle and I think one thing, the way that they're overlapping all their symbols with the, the Z rod and everything else, I think it just highlights further how they're able to pick things out of it and make sense of it just from a glance, whereas we're here discussing it further. And it's said to um, not have, uh, uh, not follow the, the script that we're used to um, um, before the, uh, um, the, the usual alphabet that they talk about a symbol sort of script but um they have this um Ogham script which is um an early medieval alphabet used primarily to write um uh, the early Irish language but they're similar they're very similar and um you can see that in a lot of their 400 surviving inscriptions on stone monuments but they, they're showing us how these um th this is different types of ways of writing and that before um 
writing the alphabet and the way that we know came to Britain. This is how people were able to communicate with each other and it's something they definitely understood. And I think that's something that needs to be kept in mind is that people just think this is symbols and just drawings and possibly would have been something for decoration, but um, they're clearly talking to each other through these stones and making themselves known. Now, this stone that we're looking at would have been a little bit bigger, um, but obviously due to um, building, um, it has gone to disrepair and you see um, part of it obviously broken at the bottom, but not much of it would be in the ground anyway. And the reason why they're so well preserved is because they'll be in the ground with um, a little bit of it on the end and then it would fall um, into the mud and it gets left preserved. And one thing that's quite interesting about all of this, I think, is that they believe that this is that a lot of it has been carved by um, a similar stone mason to other stones as well. And this would lead to suggest that, um, that just like they would have had um, beautifully painted pottery and beautifully painted um, uh, metalwork, you have these beautifully painted, um, uh, beautifully painted stones as well. And one thing that's amazing about this is how Scotland is decided to protect all of this because they have, um, oop, didn't mean to go into that one, but they have protected it and they've protected it by putting it in class chambers, in um, even taking them to museums, lots of different ways. They've even put fences around them. So they're going above and beyond to um, look after them. And then we come to here, which is an Elgin uh, Cathedral. And um, this cathedral is gorgeous to even look at, and it has a connection to um, some of these stones as well. And it shows us this stone that was found uh, nearby, and you can see um, some of the images on there. The uh, ooh, See, again, this sort of Z rod that's going down here as well. Um, you're starting to see animals down by here, and um, it looks like um, things running. It looks like um, another animal, like um, maybe a wolf or something running. Is all different types of ones. It looks like a, a man on a horse here. So all different types of symbols and something that is definitely sort of left archaeologists scratching their heads. But I think that, that's the amazing thing about things like this is that you can still have this debate and still have different types of information coming forward um, each and every day, which is amazing. And you, you're starting to see how these stones are being important to um, to the people of Scotland as well. And I think one thing that you need to know about when we look at this is uh, the different types of symbols that you can have with them as well. Um, I've read that loads of different animals can be meaning loads of different things and um, loads of people have sort of discussed further on what they could possibly mean as a whole, which um, we'll get into when we start looking at um, recreations of what they would have looked like. But they, they found this amazing stone um, quite uh, recently and they, they were cleaning it up and um, they're the, the, the cleaning it up and basically this stone, as you can see here, there's a, a bit of a plant growth here we grow in. So this would have been sticking out um, and noticeable to people, but they would have uh, ignored it. And this was uh, found in a, um, in a, in a churchyard and they're the, the cleaning it up and um, they the people clearly didn't make much of a fuss on it because in their eyes they felt like this is possibly just uh, stones that have um, that, that, that this possibly a gravestone leave it we won't um, bother with it um, don't want to mess around with it too much which is um, fair enough it, it can be um, understood understandable that you don't want to mess around with uh, someone's uh, stone but um, what they were able to find was that this was a uh, Pictish stone and you can't really see anything right now because it's covered in this clay and that's what's preserved it so well is that it was covered in this clay um, but as you can see where this woman is cleaning you're starting to see this um, these patterns all down around by here and this is what's been really interesting them and 
something that seems to be um, even more amazing and exciting as it is. Um, the more they look into it, the further it goes and it just seems to be even more of a, an amazing thing to find out. It seems like they're finding these little beauties by accident. It's not something that people are going out and actively um, looking for. And it shows that archaeology like this is being hidden in plain sight. It's, it's there, it's staring at us, it's, it's almost mocking us, really. And people are just sort of walking past it every day. And what they think is uh, found is that is this stone was abandoned and it was found in a graveyard. And what has gone on is that this stone has seen a lot of history as well, other than just the Picts. Because this stone had fallen from the Pictish people from their time and it was being well preserved in the clay and it was re-erected again and uh, people decided that maybe we all use this as a headstone yeah this is a great idea for to use as a headstone um we'll, we'll use it as a headstone and it fell again um and ooh, i think i've gone a little bit further yeah i have um apologies i'm there's one photo that's in the wrong place this is what they uh, were able to find so where that woman was cleaning that's where all these swirls were, the, all the ones on the side. So this is amazing because this stone is not just um, being shown in uh, just on one side, this is all the other side. And I don't know if you can see here, um, but the front of it was an inscription mm. of a Mr. Hugh um, and some other names um, on January, um, the second possibly 1796 this this was found and they thought you know what this would be great as a, um, a tombstone and they were like yeah this is a great idea we'll, we'll use it and so even though it's been damaged I think it just tells us more of the story of the history and how um, it's had a place really in terms of the church and this person used this as their um, uh, headstone really and you've seen a lot of images so on the back of it you're seeing this cross here um, which is it goes with it, um, but they're still keeping their Pictish um, imagery here with the um, dragons sort of uh, being face to face to each other. Um, and at the front, you're starting to see other interesting uh, ones like oxen here, um, and you're seeing ones of a, 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 of a warrior's face. And um, one thing that is quite interesting about us all is that it's very intricate the detailing, and I think it you could sit there looking at it for hours and still find some more information and more information and more information. It just seems to be, uh, keep going. And um, this is, uh, it's, an, it's important because um, this would have been um, 2.4 meters high. And this is um, the Cannon um, bridge area um, in a Christian church site. And this was found in 2019. So you've seen a lot of people trying to recreate it. So uh, someone had clearly drawn this out. Um, it's now um, displayed in the, the Dingwall Museum in 2020 as well, but it's thought to be 1,200 years old. And you're starting to see this shift really from um, this. So this is the, the, the recreation, but with color on it and they've done it on a wood. Um, just, I don't know why they've done it on a wood. Um, but the recreations of it is amazing. And when you start to add colour to it, you're starting to see more imagery. So you're starting to see this um, this sea rod here is still going down. Oh, God, I'm using a, a red pen to go over something that's red. So that, that was completely useless of me um, to do. But you're starting to see the cross and the other things about it and even the knots and just all the animals um, intertwined. And I personally think as well is a reflection on how well um, the connecting with um, their legends, their beliefs, but also the, the world around them. So, Because you see this um, warrior type thing with an animal head um, and is holding a shield and a sword. Um, and then you have this amazing sort of uh, creature, I've forgotten what the name of these sort of creatures, this one by here. Um, it just reminds me of that thing from Narnia with the Scott, like a human body with the uh, a horse's or uh, uh, no a human top half and a horse's bottom half if that makes sense and um, I've forgotten what they've called um mine's gone completely blank but I will find it after the break you watch it'll be that sort of annoying thing where I come back and I'll be like I remember now um go on Anne a fawn wasn't it a fawn I'm not sure is it cent centaur or something like oh yeah centaur 
Yeah, so one of them. And so, yes, but it actually looks more like a wolf. Yeah, it, but it's, it's, it's a, a, yeah, but it's at the top of the man here. It, it, it just is the top of a man, but it is this part here, isn't oh, it? Oh, yes. I can see yeah. It now. Oh, yeah. I know what you mean about that one, Del. I apologise. It should have been more clear. That now. Yeah, but it, he's, he's holding two axes, isn't he? And um, I think that's one thing that confuses people, I think, is that, that makes them think that they're very yeah. uh, savage and warlike. Like so small. Yeah, I, I always thought a fawn was from fairyland. It's like a half goat half man you know yeah uh, uh, isn't it the centaur was much more you know well horse man gods, you know. yeah yeah but narnia they were fawns <laughs> yeah, no, yeah it's been a like while since i've watched narnia in all man fairness goat. man goat yeah we'll call it a man goat <laughs> we'll call mm. it that um horse man whatever card. you know yeah, we'll, we'll pick his brains on it because yeah. I, I'm well, I'll Google it in the break, but um, my mind's gone completely blank on what it's called. And but we'll find out. Um, centaur, yeah, a centaur. I, I, I feel like it's that, but we'll have a look. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you can, I think that's one thing that sort of confuses people is because you're seeing this warrior with a, 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 an animal's head here with mm. a shield and, yes. and the sword, and then you're next to this man that's like half horse or mm. um goat with uh, th these two axes in their hands i think people look at that and think oh possibly this is um this this is very barbaric people they, they, they're very uh, violent and i think no i think um when well. you put it when you put color on it you start and but the symbols mean completely different things anyway but when you put color on it i think it gives mm. a completely different meaning um without color they can sort of seem very similar to each other Yes, um, do you think it could be their first impressions of someone coming up from the south? Mm -hmm. um, like what Carl doesn't like us to call Celt. You know, yeah. riding horses, men on horses, women on horses, coming yeah. up, wielding stuff. Because I think that's what's centaurs were originally in Greek myth. Yeah. People couldn't understand these people riding horses and it's just come back from about 20,000 years ago when yeah. people first sort of domesticated how I was just going to say houses, horses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, domesticated I... houses and rode them. Yeah, I think that that's quite a valid interpretation of it, Del. Yeah. I think another one that you could go into, and this was just yeah. the first thing that I come into my head, is that if you've got a Christian symbol on one side and they're sort of going into that culture shift to mm. Christianity, is this maybe possibly the earlier sort of gods and what they believe them mm. to be? Because you see is the Christian symbol post this car then? Pardon? But it, is it post that carving? The carving well, that's on my right hand side. Yeah. With the horse, the what I call a penguin, the blue thing and the orange thing. Yeah. Um the one on the left, which is the cross, obviously, could that have been done a lot later to sort of superimpose Christianity rather than but they left the back. Because mm. it was insignificant. Well, I, it, it's very well. From what I'm just I read, being it's, it's all right. It's all right. From what I read, this stone was a contemporary, and um, so each side was done at the same time. Oh, right, and right. That's one thing I, I I needed to touch upon really if, mm -hmm. that I should do, and I, we'll touch upon this, and we'll go further then after the break. But I'll touch upon no this problem. before the break, um, because I should have said at the beginning, my mind just all over the place at the moment. I feel like my mind's mush. And um, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Um this, 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 the the window. You did you did say that they were reused. They'd been reused, the stones. Mm. Yeah, some of them have been oh, yeah, uh, reused. Carving of the what's his face. Yeah, um, Mr. Hugh, hang on, I'll get it up now. I'll just get rid of my little scribbles. Yeah. Um because it, the one this oh, what is it? This this one has that's been reused. One, one. Um, 
yes. in the 1700s. It's, it's clearly they had found it and they thought it was great to put someone's name on it. But these different awesome. types of classes. Yeah. Mm. Mm. These different types of classes. So you have class one, which are unworked stones with symbols on them, and there's no cross mm. on them either side. They're mm. the earlier stages. And then you get to class two where the stones are a little bit more rectangular in shape mm. and they've got a bit of a cross and some symbols on one or both the sides. Mm. And then when you get to class three, it seems like they are more, um, mm. more Christian than they are um, Pictish. It was almost like they, they're slowly yes. going into that change of religion and beliefs and um, they're still trying to cling on to their, their origins, really. And I think... Well, yes. A lot of people think that the class three is maybe too simplistic, and that's something that Historic Scotland has said. They're too simplistic and mm. is not considered a useful category but class but three. I think, yeah, sorry to interrupt again, but I oh. think post Constantine the first, when Christianity became sort of popular and the religion to have, yeah, you know. Jesus and God, uh, oh, yes, we've got to worship them. No, never mind about anything else. But all the other stuff came in, and which yeah. is why I think, and apologies to any Catholics, but that's why I think that some faiths, faiths like the Catholics, Orthodoxes, and whatever, still revere saints and stuff mm. because it's a sort of throw but oh we better not leave this we better not leave that it's just that i'm an yeah I've, i an think independent what I, non-conformist i, I, I think accept we, everything that everybody believes but looking at christian history from what i studied of it it's a case of right okay Everybody had to adhere to Christianity after Constantine the first, second, and whoever came yeah. after. Therefore, oh yeah, oh okay. But how do we, how do we, how do we worship this? How do we worship that? So they sort of brought them in, mm. like we do today. Like we do today. Like today, it's a case of you know people were Christians. Why you know? Worship angels mm. and pray to them, have effigies and all sorts of stuff. You know, I don't believe there's any right way or wrong way. If anybody wants to go to God, they'll find their way. So, you know, I'm not yeah. dissing any sort of Christian faith. You are. You are preaching now. Am I? Yes. Oh, sorry, Anne. <laughs> Sorry, I think Anne. anyone who talks to me knows that I I, I, I don't care what religion. No, um, but sorry, I Anne, think but each it's... sometimes religion is used for yeah. um, no, negative Albert, things. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. understand Catholicism because but, I hey, never... honestly, honestly Dell, we shouldn't yeah. be going. We shouldn't be going into right. You know, that's lovely. Religion. That's lovely because it's... Jesse's been away with the Catholics to Lords. Twice, it's history, you know, yeah. it's history, it's history, and I think things have changed over time. Things have been brought in, things have been thrown out, things have been brought in, things have been brought thrown out, and I think people have naturally diverged, which mm. means, we, well, like two the times. Or if you're this, we'll burn you. If you're that, we'll burn Oops. you. Oh, no, no, no. And that's horrible. Yeah, but right, let's leave religious away. Religion yeah, away. Yeah, no, no, I think one thing that Sorry, you've got, got to say, religion, I think, it, in principle, is, is very good religion, but you've got people who use religion to yes. uh, legitimise their, their, their bad behaviour sometimes, and I think that gives religion a negative thing. Oh. I don't care what you believe. If you're a nice person, that's... All that matters to me, and I think uh, Anna will agree oh, yeah. after our uh, long conversations that we've had as well. Um, yeah. I've been on a few spiritual journeys and something that I, I, I do love the Catholic religion in terms of the art, etc., and looking at the books. Um, I love the way of worship because I've got, um, oh, oh, what do you call it? The beads with the cross. 
Yeah. And I do that every rosary. day. Rosary. Yeah. The rosary. And I do that as part of my worship for something else. Oh. I'll say it now because if we ever meet up, I can't drink because I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. So I've joined AA and that's one of the things that helps me every morning. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Prayers and the alcoholic prayers that I do, the AA prayers I do and stuff. Mm. So I don't just, and my son went, because he's autistic, he had the opportunity to go to Lords twice. Yeah. With an organisation and it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and I think... What we've seen here is that it doesn't matter what time period at all, symbolism no. is important <laughs> um, is. for things and, and to allow people to feel like they're mm. having that connection, maybe with something higher or to tide themselves over. And I think that's what you start to see with this is that um, slowly they go into Christianity and um, mm. eventually Christianity um, is the one that tops over their symbolism and yes. the class three is just... Um, crosses etc being shown but I do I do like how you, you've got the mixture here it's almost like it's this merging of cultures at the moment yes. they're, they're going from their culture of maybe possibly looking at these what because you see a lot of them um, in history a lot of civilizations have these um gods which can be very um hybrids of people and animals and they seem to be very warlike and they, they stand mm. for different things so I do think maybe these two are a relation to that and mm. um, we can definitely see here a, a lovely seahorse. So, yes. and I do put the oxen at the bottom. And um, I don't know, I felt oh, like that yeah. was like some sort of like phoenix or something like that, um, that weird animal. However, I do think they're sort of trying to um, remember. Oh, fox. A fox, phoenix. It's, it's that little thing on his head, isn't it? I don't, yeah. I don't, know, don't know what it is. <laughs> But I do think it shows that they've got a belief in mythical creatures that they and um, a very good connection with the wider world and the landscape around them, the animals that they're interacting, and they felt like it was important to them to put in. But mm. I think um, so. On the front of it would be this Christian cross, and on the back it would be all these animals. Um, yeah, that, and black, I, that black effigy. I haven't got a clue what that represents. No, it, it looks like um a, like a, a weird horse thing, doesn't it? With a long blonde hair that's holding <laughs> something. Uh, and it's, it, it's a cooking pot. Yeah, that yeah, that's what I noticed as well as the uh, cooking well, pot. You can see the shield in that, but it's the that's cooking... bizarre. Yeah, you know, and I that's... wouldn't have a clip. That's probably something spiritual from the spiritual world. Mm. So the shame and the Well, saying that, if you look closely, so, sorry about this, Dale, if you look closely at said cooking pot, round bow here where I'm putting that dot in, it's got an eye in ah. it. So well, w whether that be, some, oh, God knows, whether that be an animal that they've also part of their mythical creatures, I don't know. But what, when you look at this in recreation and then you put it towards... Um, the 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 ooh, hang on if it wants to work for me if you have it's very hard to sort of see it all when you're looking at it like that but this recreation oh, yes. really really put this into yes. a perspective and there's a lot of symbolism in it and I think what they're trying to tell us is that they're taking on Christianity and I think that was part of the first part of it, the front side and on the reverse yeah. they're still keeping true to their origins yeah. and their beliefs and I do think it's almost like that idea of the yew tree um, using a stone maybe to gather and worship and preach and yes. hear all those types of things. Um, and I think it, th this one is seen to be quite important as well because it's starting to show us this um, this change um, to different um, to a different way of life, a different way of thinking. Um, and that's where you start to see, but there's a lot of uh, magical beasts on there, an oxen, um, an mm. animal headed warrior with a sword and a shield, a, a double disc that we see there, a, mm -hmm. a Z-rod symbol, and a, a, this large ornate Christian cross as well on there. Um, mm. What I'll do, um, well, well, we'll have a look at it first. Um, so this dating of this is also has brought a um, bit of a breakthrough as well. Um, 
because they started to realise maybe we need to push back the dating of this as well. Um, and I think this is just an earlier form of language and um, maybe a, a way of identity as well and sort of keeping their, their uh, name true through stone. But we'll, we'll have a break now. I'll ask everyone questions and then we'll uh, have our break and get on with it. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, so, Del, is there anything you'd like to ask? Yeah, I'd like to apologise to Anne. Is Anne there? She's still there. Yeah, she is. There she is. Hi, hey, Anne. I'd like to apologise. I didn't mean to offend. You don't, you don't know me because you don't know why it's offended me, but I will tell you one day. I know you're a Catholic. You do with Catholicism either. Mm. <coughs> right, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. It's just that with my education with Christianity, I've looked across the board and I think I worded it wrong and I apologise. That's all right. So I, I accept your apology. Oh, lovely. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's accepted. I, I just think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people... I talk before my mind engages. Because um, we need to try and look at the over-picts, you know, the picts. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yes. I, I know where you together. get to Yes. friends <laughs> um but yeah no that that's cool thank you Dan. that's and fine that's fine jess i'm gonna look at my oven now is that right who's charles perkins oh gosh no. i don't know <laughs> i don't know well if, if charles wants to speak he can if he needs to <laughs> um pat anything that you'd like to say probably no. put him off no um and no I like the pics, you know, I, I think they're uh, really interesting. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, you said about war paint. I, I think it could be just like tattoos, really. You know, they like to paint their bodies, you know, and uh, yeah. they didn't look like really aggressive or anything, you know, the, the painting. Um, so, yeah, it was, it's interesting. Is no, it, no, I, it's a lovely period, actually. It's, we probably know more about, you know, people in after the Romans, you know, through them, than um, as native people, you know, uh, yeah. than, than we do of anyone, you know. Yeah, and I think one thing that's quite interesting is that we know quite a bit about them with their symbolism, but they've also shown us that change in culture with Christianity as well. Yeah. Because they accepted it, didn't they, quite readily. They were, quite, yeah. uh, you know, they, they, they were obviously very oh. easygoing. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's why we need to sort of change the way they're perceived, because mm. um, definitely anyone in Wales and Scotland and Ireland, they, they, they weren't this uh, backward country, that they were very accepting to diversity and connections with other people and different ways of life. Um, and I, I think that's something that people need to sort of focus on rather than just dismissing them, really. But thank you, Anne. Thank you a lot. Um, Bill, anything that you'd like to ask or add? Um, the only, only one thing um, about yeah. the, the carvings is that um, when we were in Orkney and also when we went to Inverness to look at this yeah. famous Pictish stone, what's always prominent, as you mentioned a few times in the last hour, yes, <coughs> the Z symbol. Uh, an interpretation of what that means. Um, does it depict a journey, possibly from life to death, with all the tunes mm. in life? I don't know. But uh, I think there's a big debate on about uh, Pictish interpretation and what it all means, you know. Just, uh, yeah. It's like hieroglyphs, isn't it? Again. Yeah, that's, and that's something that they've uh, compared it to, really, is that it's, it's, it's like hieroglyphs, and so we need to have uh, more of a, maybe a specific thing just sat there looking at them and trying to okay. find evidence of what everything is just like we have with them um, yeah. because they're trying to tell us a story whether that be about them or their tribe or their culture or what they believe they're telling us a story yeah, yeah. It's so it, it does need um, more research into that aspect of what, what that language is because it is a language 
Yeah. On all, all these the sculpted stones, it's a language saying something, some things we can guess at them, some things we can't, but there's got to be a common theme somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's an ongoing, yeah, no. fascinating subject, isn't it? Yeah. It means, you know? yeah. Thank yeah. you, Bert, Bill. Um, Henry, anything you'd like to ask or add? Uh, I just sent a, a post uh, to everyone about uh, looking at the Aberdeenshire County Council site. Yeah. Um, they actually have a page actually on Pictish symbol stones. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a good little uh, thing to look at there. So, uh, yeah, if anyone's interested, you can have a gander in the break or even save it and have a gander after the lesson. So, um, right. Definitely an amazing um, group of people, and I really can't wait to get delving deeper and show you the uh, recreation of some of these amazing stones. Because it seems like now, with more that they're finding, more interest is coming, and more people are actually actively trying to uh, whittle down more information about it. So um, I think I've asked everyone, other than Charles Perkins, and who's got their hand up still, but uh, I don't know who Charles Perkins is. So hello, Charles, if you're there. <laughs> Um, and uh, <laughs> need to say anything pretty in the chat so we'll have our break and then we'll come back so uh, take care and I'll see you in a bit bye, bye. bye.
Yes, I am. I was going to say, I don't know about this uh, archaeology stuff. I don't, I don't believe in, you know, protesting and things. I was just, I just wondered if, um, you know, you should. I don't know who's going to do it, do it really. You know, we said get two people together, but uh, the only sure. thing I. The only thing I've done is I've um I did uh talk to Sarah Murphy about the graves, you know, at the park prison. Yeah. And you know, there's a big debate going on about those, but the, actually there's been so many protests against it that the builders won't build there. So it could be that they've moved somewhere else now. <laughs> Well, ideally, you need a recognised group in the British India. Yeah, I mentioned the um, the Civic Society, yeah. and, I, and I remember um, a name there was Charles Charles Thorpe, I think, um, mm. because I've had some experience with this before. Because years back, you know, Tondi, where the development is in Tondi, all yeah. these and all that and houses. Mm. And years back, the um, they were going to develop that. Mm. But they what what did um, I will comment, you know, and uh, the Clinby Valley Historical Society because it was in the Clinby Valley. Yeah. Um, and we wrote back and objected to it, you know, but yeah. it, it didn't do any make any difference at all, actually. No. But but uh, as individuals, you you I, I think it's pointless individuals actually complaining. You you have more club if a, a group actually um, mm. um, well, I, I, that on headed nose. Uh, or headed note paper, you know, that's why I mentioned the civics yeah. society. Yeah. Um, so well, you, I don't know if the civic society or the civic trust were, uh, I think Lynn was involved with that and Lynn Jones and, and they, they, they kind of focused all their attention on St. John's house, I think. Yeah. I think, in the, in, you know, there's a lot of people involved with that. Yeah. Yeah. So but maybe, but maybe this maybe the civic society is aware of this already and doing something about it. I, I don't know. But I think it should come from an organized group around the Virgin area, you know. That's only name I can I come up with. Well the thing is they might not even know about it. I mean Joe uh Carl is now part of the you know the antiquarian society or something, and he's responsible for um finding these places that are, that are actually going to be um, in danger. Mm. So whether he's getting forward notice of things, yeah. 
than you know than anyone else um especially to do with ancient woodlands and things like that yeah, but, but, there are, there are, but there are no ancient woodlands the description i read okay you know where i am now in yeah. Cherry Housing Estate, opposite the Christian College. Yeah. From there to the start of our uh, Larson is only what, what half a mile? Yeah. All that, is, all that is fields. Yeah. No ancient woodland at all. No. So I assume from the description that's what we're talking about, you know. Yeah. But uh, maybe Dallas got contacts with um, the civic society. Yeah. So he's uh, he's up for it. So um yeah, let him drive it. Yeah, well, he's saying that well, the archaeology Camry, Bridgen Archaeology Camry. Well, I mean, we've never actually stood together on anything. Yeah. Um, you know. But you've got to start with writing letters, and if yeah. you're writing letters on behalf of behalf of a group, you mm -hmm. need to write something like the secretary on headed note note paper. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we don't that organised yeah. from our point of view. As archaeology Cam Camry, we are sort of group wise uh, in Glamorgan and the Carl. So yeah. we haven't got a set official separate Bergen group. We just uh, it's a group of students, uh, the Bergen branch of archaeology can be as such. That's what I think um, the Civic Trust or the, the Civic uh, Society, whoever's up and running these well, days. Well, you know, I mean, Bridgen, Bridgen Archaeology Cymru does exist on Facebook and it does exist um, in yeah basically on facebook and and if i were to ask if i were to look for money you know for to pay for our rent for a building which we probably wouldn't be able to get but if i if i was i would ask on behalf of pretend archaeology camry mm -hmm. because carl's already getting money for archaeology camry yeah or grants you know but we are two smaller group. There's, there's only two, three of us, all, isn't that really? Or just three, four, or four of us now. So you you need a bigger this, representation than that. This, well, actually, <laughs> actually, can we group? There's hundreds on, but I don't know them. They're all calls. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm saying. You know, we, we, we're not a structured organization on our own. We're all in the calls wing and we. And I, I only got about six on my, <laughs> I, got about, I got about 10 people on Bridge End yeah, Archaeology yeah. Cymru. I think one thing that we should do is sort of uh, make people aware at first, and maybe that's like the first stage of it, um, yeah. talking to people who could help. Um, I know I'm not on Bridge End, but I've written everything down, and um, I would even talk to people in terms of my connections as well and try and make it known that way. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look as a... Well, yeah, I mean, we need to know exactly. Like, he sent us some sort of link. I don't know where it is now, but we need to know exactly who is saying this about it. You know, who, who yeah. is from promoting this and... Um, proposing this building and what it, where exactly is it going to be? Mm. Yeah, that be. Well, what about uh, the, the local MP for Bridgend? Who is that? That's Sarah Murphy. Oh, and the local MP is is that uh, man in Port Paul. Okay. So they have surgeries, don't they? Maybe yeah, they have maybe surgeries. Somebody, they... somebody can make an appointment. And to yeah. go to the game and raise the yeah. issue within there, you know. Just and start. maybe well, Sarah, start off very light and get as heavy yeah. as we could. Um because I know I've got yeah. I've got one friend, he, he's a he's a Labour Party member, he's my best friend. Um, but he, he feels the same way as we do. And so um he's got better connections than me. So maybe if I sort of pester him a little bit, um well, and see if he can Murphy is the local she's just been voted in as the Labour MS. Mm. She's a member of the Senate, but I don't know who she's replacing. You know, like she's a member of the Senate. Was she? Be, but Madeline Moon was our MP. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think it's probably best to go with MS or anyone from the council because MPs yeah. housing is is a Welsh Assembly uh, um, um, thing. Um, P is a conservative, you know. Yeah, well, you're not going to get really much yeah, far with them, are they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but, you know, Sarah Murphy, she she should stand for, I mean, the problem with this, oh, anyway, go on. There yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the lesson and we'll, uh, when Carl comes back, we'll have this discussion um, further, because I think it, that that's why we, maybe if we have like a few little Zoom meetings or something. What's going on about? Christianity. <laughs> and yeah, Let's not mention it. I think one thing yeah, that we won't mention it again. Um, <laughs> I just mean, used right, the wrong I, wording. I, I know. I think I didn't, else knows. I didn't mean oh. it the way it came out. What I meant was things have changed over time. Yeah, and I think that that's that that's oh, yeah, with anything we really. It? I think it's best to leave it. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think one thing that's, uh, that, that I've got in my notes about all of this as well mm. um, is the way that, because it, it, you're showing signs that they're mm. bringing Christianity into their um, artwork and it seems to be very something, something that they relate to and something that they feel like is important just as much as their history. But I think it's that whole um, opposite attracting as well, isn't it? Um, that you mm. can merge things together clashing of ideas sometimes work and I think that's something that they obviously felt like um and uh, the, the one example is uh, uh I could give that could be possibly rubbish as an example but m my boyfriend's laid back I'm very much yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, constantly on some sort of rant as well on the daily um and he seems to bring me back down to work but it's like that idea of sometimes things that clash complement each other I think that's what they felt like with this. Um, did I put this in the PowerPoint? No, I did not. Hang on a minute. Oh, the ball. I haven't seen these painted uh, stones before. Pardon, Anne? I've never seen this uh, aspect of them before, you know, the painted symbols. Yeah, that's um, a new thing that they come in with. They've come yeah. with the conclusion that they would have been painted. If they're painting themselves and their artwork and their pot then it would make sense that these would be painted mm. we have found evidence of um, minerals and plants on the surface of this to create a pigment <laughs> but where they've cleaned it obviously they've got rid of a lot of evidence um quickly that was what I was trying to uh, point towards when I was talking about that man with the horse's body I thought it was one of them that was, that's what I was coming up with with this um these centaurs but um could possibly be wrong um but as you could see wh where I'm coming from then when you see that gray figure there that's what I just thought of um when I first saw it um let's see if I can get back on the slideshow now pardon Del sorry can I add to those stones once you've done this bit um yeah well you can do it now if you want oh okay thank you um, when I was growing up um, on Brinketh in Common, not far from MacArthur Glen, mm -hmm. um, where we lived, we had these dram roads, which went from a quarry, you know, taking the bits and pieces out. But one of the roads led off to an isolated house and in the sort of little stream, and I can only describe it as a stream or even a ditch at the side of the dram road, um, yeah. there was a stone. And when my grandfather was, this was in the 60s, he took the stone up because he was one of the ones who used to help clean this ditch stream yeah. to make sure it was free running and, you know, Mm. There was no need to, but that's what they did in those days. They had to keep busy, otherwise their wives would have them doing stuff in the house. But yeah, he did this and he pulled it up. And this day, I distinctly remember looking at it because it was wet. Yeah. They had, oh, what's that? Oh, there's pictures on there. I didn't relate it to right dinner. And I just, oh, look, there's pictures, is it? Oh, yeah, he said, we got it from up the road. He said, it's got markings on it. It's, it's, he said, oh, it's ages old. It doesn't matter. It's years old. <laughs> <laughs> and then he put it back down. Fortunately, faced on, but it's disappeared. It disappeared around about 1986 when the Gwalia commoners 
uh, did a lot of work around there, getting rid of old pathways and whatnot, mm -hmm. and putting new drainage in, but it completely disappeared. But I'm convinced that would have been a marker of something, because I remember it had, uh, otherwise, as a child, it must have been about, oh, four? Yeah. But I said, because, you know, I was doing my letters, as oh, that's got pictures. That's got pictures. Because mm. it had swirly mm. things and whatnot. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was coming from up there. It used to be an old road, roadway marker. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's one of those things that's now lost. Yeah. And it's a shame. These it things is a shame, gone. yeah. And I think if we find little streams with stone, little stone bridges, or that are wide enough to have a stone bridge, and there's one there, mm -hmm. I think we should sort of, right, come on, let's lift this up now, look what's underneath. Yeah. Because the surface would have been worn okay. down. Yeah. But the yeah. underneath nice would still be there. Yeah, and that's the and beauty I'm, of these things. Yeah, yeah, but my family would sort of affluent enough to have cameras and stuff and never took pictures which yeah. is a shame yeah it is a shame and yeah, i think it's a shame. It, it is with things like this it, you can get they can get lost etc and it can be very oh, infuriating yeah, yeah, yeah. um and I, I think in terms of writing um it reminded me as a kid i i was quite weird with the way i uh, i wouldn't play with dolls i wouldn't play with cars or anything I according to my mum I'd have these fake plastic glasses on and a piece of paper saying would you sign my comparation god knows what that means but I would constantly be there writing and I remember as a kid that I would write swirls different types of swirls and different shapes and they meant something to me and I knew what they meant but everyone just saw it as scribbles on a piece of paper and I think we've got to look at it that way because it meant something to them and um, one thing that's quite interesting because I know Henry likes his uh, academic articles and um, things like that. So um, the Royal Society Publishing, they've got an open access online article that's very easy to navigate. Is called Pictish Symbols Revealed as a Written Language Through Application of Shannon Entroy, um, Entropy. Sorry, um, and I'll, I'll put the name and all that in there. It's um, by a few people, Rob Lee, Philip Jonathan and Pauline Zimnan. And this article is amazing. It's something that I've got a lot of my thinkings from. But back to the stones, because, well, I was talking about the stones, but back to um, this specific stone that they found here in the River Don near Aberdeen. Um, they found this stone and you can see them lifting it out. And this one seems to be um, a, not a very neat stone in terms of it being very square, but you can see that it's starting to. And this is what they had found on there. Um, and there's a beautiful one. And it was because of the low um, levels of water due to oh. um, hot climate at the time that they had this discovery and this is a class one Pictish stone so this is one of the earlier um, examples and um, it had carved symbols of a triple disc with a cross bar and a mirror and um, a notch rectangle um, with two internal spirals fans on it and they thought this was from the 8th century AD and this gave the, the more of a debate on the meanings of what they meant. But I think it's fair to say that these stones are quite rare, but they're popping up more and more. And I think it just sort of highlights how these that these people, the picks, are Europe's lost people, one of lost people. And these are almost like stones that we can use as a, a, a way of accessing them. And it's showing us these early medieval kingdoms in Scotland, and they have very distinctive features. I think that's one thing that you, you can say about them. But we can trace the development of literacy and beliefs in Northeast Scotland because of this. And the Scotland is very proud of their archaeology, and they've tried preserving this in the best way that they can, so they can show it off to other people and have more um, knowledge coming from it. Um, <clears throat> And this, this was a, an amazing uh, find, really, um, and it was all thanks to the weather. You find that sometimes natural um, natural occurrences can help us find things like this, um, with Orkney and the erosion, um, and with this with the low-level uh, water um, in 
but he's showing us everyday things as well, like the mirror and you've seen the beautiful spirals on it. And it seems like that this was something they had in common with each and every one of them. And the, the, the archaeologists were called here to have a look and they had to come and remove the stone from the river, which is what they did. And they said this was a, a wonderful example of the local authority, um, of a local authority and... Um, and what's going on here, they should, they're able to show how they can protect the archaeology as well as getting closer to what they mean. And they were looking at these stones and they found that they had very distinctive features on there. Um, and this was an example of the many other stones that they had, which are freestanding stones. And like Dell said, it would it, the fact that it would have fallen into um, mud, it would have preserved it. And that's why we're able to still see these markings because they're made from sandstone. So oh. they can, for example, this one here, um, you can see bits of uh, erosion on it. And sometimes, uh, sometimes some of the means can be lost. But that's because of the sandstone. And if it's being protected in the clay, like um, this one has, and that's it, them lifting it out. Um, it gets protected by the, the, the clay, the mud, and it, it can look like a basic stone, but when they clean it up, they start to seal this. But one part of the discussion is, is that um, when you add colour to it, it can change the way that it means. And this is what people have started to talk about, because they think that not just the symbols mean something, but the colours of them can mean something. And that, that I think that's very important to note because just without the colour, they can all look the same and they can all have possibly no meaning. They could just look like stones with inscriptions on them. But when you add the colour to them, they can give us a step further to what they are. And the Picts are, are known to be colourful people um, with their identity. And that's part of their identity of, to say who they were. They were very colourful. And you saw that in their clothes, in the way that they painted their um, body, their metalwork, their pottery, um, and even their stones. And I think this just shows how colour can mean things to them um, just as much as the symbol means things. And I think you can have possibly a similar symbol, maybe an eagle on one stone found, found in one spot and another stone with an eagle found in the other. But they could have been painted completely differently. And it's like a coat of arms, really, um, that each colour can mean something different based on that person. But I think it's showing us individuals in the groups depicted in how they're, they're telling their story through their version of illumination. They're not doing it through manuscripts, they're doing it through stone. And we're having recreations being brought forward that allow us to have a, a sense of what each and every one of them means. And they, like I said, they go from animals and symbols to then the, the Christian symbol towards the end. And it seems like Christianity is the thing that wins in the end. It, it overtakes everything that we know. But there's different um, discussions on terms of uh, what the symbolism means. And like I said, the, the class one uh, ones have um, things like horseshoes on them, crescents, crescents with a V-rod, um, a mirror, um, even fish, eagles, boas, wolves, and uh, seahorses. And then you go a little bit further and you start to see more evidence of Christian symbolism. And I think they just further highlight really what is just important. And I think it's just that paganism and Catholicism or Christian Christianity sort of merging together and complementing each other. And you do see that with other um, cultures as well. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to point towards is that Sutton Who, for example, because you have an evidence there of um, pagan motif, uh, motifs and pagan um, connotations. We also have an evidence of Christianity in it as well. And I think we're seeing that change really in time of beliefs. And serpents seem to be very important with them as well. And serpents, I think, doesn't matter where you are, serpents have got some sort of importance. When we were looking at the mound builders um, in America, um, that serpent mound, um, serpents seem to have a, a lot of symbolism and meaning to a lot of people. But um, they have a lot of fascination with these zoomorphic figures and they depict both natural animals and mythical creatures. And I think they're representations of animals that are around them. 
but also animals as part of their beliefs and their legends as well. And the amount of number of uh, symbols that are there are uncertain and they're debated. Um, but at the moment, they believe that there's between 40 to 50 symbols. Um, but what they mean is not easily defined. And as you get along throughout time, it just ends up going to uh, Christianity. Um, but when I was looking at the mirror and comb, which seems to be something that the two symbols that have come up together as well, is that they are both represented on things to do with um, women as well, with uh, the maiden stone that we'll look at as well, that it shows that. Um, and I think this just sort of shows their everyday life and they're just things that, um, that I think it just, to me, having a, a mirror and a comb together, it was a symbol of fem femininity, femininity and gender. So maybe that's how they're able to have a memory of a woman of society in their society, um, or maybe a memory of a deceased husband or woman who um, she wants to mem memory, uh, put his memory in stone. But it, there's a lot of debate around it, of course. But we'll get to um, these amazing recreations because this is something that they started to do. Um, archaeologists have started to uh, uh, put the colour in with this. Now, obviously, we don't know exactly what colours were put in this, so they're doing their best to uh, understand with what they would have had around them and what it could have possibly looked like. And this could be a completely different colour to what we think it is. But this is um, an illustration of Inverness's uh, Nockengale Borstone. And for many sculptors, I think that these animals and sim symbols are just showing how impressive their tribe is, their um, society is, and how impressive they are with their stonemasonry. But um, some scholars have suggested that ancient creators have painted their stones in vi very vivid colors, and they carved lots of animals, like I said, salmon, ravens, wolves, boars, and it seems like crows are also something that's being depicted quite a lot in all of this as well. And ravens, ravens are very important. And I think these old Pictish symbols are just giving us a story of what life was like. And it's very similar to the stones that we're seeing in Mercia and Northumberland. But we can record maybe names and statuses and tribes just from this. Um, and one thing that's notable as well is that they believe that things like this in terms of as it was going into Christianity with these because they're great and very intricate these uh, detailing is that they believe that after um, using this stone masonry for their Pictish stones they went further to use these stone masons in terms of this cathedral that um, oh, I forgot the name of it um, it in um, Elgin Cathedral. So that, that's what they're making this connection is that eventually they were making much greater things. And I think to uh, paint that people of Britain, especially up in Scotland, didn't really have the advances for anything like that. I think it, it, it just, these stones sort of dismiss that and show how great they are in terms of their stone masonry as well. But when you're looking at this, you, you start to see that they're really putting their thoughts in there to try and bring to life what they would have looked like back then. And I think, um, like I said, they were colourful people in the way they looked. So it would make sense that they would uh, um, do more to show. But one thing that's a problem is that we don't exactly know what colours would have gone where. And that can be a bit of an issue. So adding colour is down to the interpretation of the historians and the archaeologists to make it educated um, guess on all of this and I think adding colour to it gives it a different meaning so when you have this colour blind sort of um, view of it all that it can look very similar and just look like symbols on the stone but when you add colour to it you can realise that maybe um, more of one colour can show a tribe or even um, an identity of a certain person but it's a very complex area and it's something that has really got people um, really het up over about but um they've long debated the origins and the activities of the pics and um historical environment scotland says that the idea that they painted these stones is speculative at the moment but i think one way of doing that is that when we find the, the next lot of them maybe sort of trying to see if we can clean them up in a way that doesn't damage what would have been there because it's thought that they would have been whitewashed as well which would be um, amazing to have a look 
But um, many scholars are agreeing that the Picts are descended, obviously, from the Iron Age people of Northern Scotland. And um, they, they, they're a group of people that sting firmly um, to their culture and their tradition until eventually they integrated into Christian society. Then you get things like this here, which is um, amazing, really, because you, you start to see that they're telling us a story. This is evidence to me that they're telling a story and they're telling us a story of a battle. So um, this is, um, ooh, where did I get my notes have gone. Um, this is the the um, um, Abba Lemino's uh, battle stone. And um, a lot of scholars have been discussing this as well. So um, this is thought to be um, a battle that they would have seen um, with a group of people. And they did interact with people like um, the Vikings, um, the Romans, and even um, the Normans as well. And it's something that they've uh, interacted with quite a few people, I think. And this is quite important to them in terms of um, getting an understanding of uh, what they were trying to tell us. And I think they're trying to tell us this battle that they had with uh, other people and what they had seen. Um, again, like Bill said, um, you, maybe this sort of Z-Rod is um, a timeline and you see it right at the top here. Actually, I'm going to change the colour of this pen because I don't feel like it's showing up as well as I, I wanted to, to uh, all of you, but, oh, is it working? Yeah, there you go. Um, so we're, we're looking for that colour blue when I'm writing. Um, Again, they're going with a different type of colour scheme here. It's mostly um, yellow at the bottom and all around, but you've got hints of red. But um, you've got this sea rod then going here. And I do like Bill's interpretation of maybe this being um, some sort of way of showing a timeline. Um, and you're seeing here that, that you're seeing people riding on horses and um, warfare and they're fighting with each other. Um, and you even see evidence of um, other animals that you've got here. Um, it's like an eagle attacking a man. Um, I think that just that eagle attacking the man. I, I I just think that maybe that sort of hit hitting towards um, maybe their uh, their gods. They believe that they had um, a, a, a connection with them to to to, to believe that they uh, would have helped them through battle. But this is um, showing the Battle of Dun, um, which is around six eighty five A D, and this was a Pictish army defeat. Um, invaders from Northumberland and this is what they're showing us is this defeat really and how ultimately um, they didn't win and they, they did want to put this in their songs because this was important to them and who they um, interacted with but it, 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 I think nevertheless it's quite interesting because they, like I said they, they believe that they used colour um, from minerals to uh, to show this but the pigment is sadly gone but we've got the the privilege of seeing these lovely carvings and I do like the fact that they've tried to recreate that to show us what it would have looked like at least um and one thing I think is quite interesting here is that um you, you're not really seeing um that the, the Pictish people and what they're represented like I showed you in the front at the beginning of this uh, lecture but it's quite interesting to see people's in different interpretations on all of this and how they've taken away something different. But this is um, this is something that showed that they were having um, conflicts of the Picts against the Mercians and the Irish and the, the, if a lot of varies in success. But then noting these sieges of territories of theirs um, from neighbouring territories as well and. The, the battle eventually did end because this was a long battle that's carried on um, led by King uh, Brydie Mac uh, Billy. Um, this was a Pictish victory um, and it did weaken Northumbria's uh, power in Northern Britain. Um, but this then sort of um, marked their independence from Northumbria and their dominance in the north. So I think that's something why they also showed this as well, because even though they had a lot of conflict and they saw maybe a few moments where they might have lost, they got back up and they carried on fighting. And because of that, they, um, they, their people were left um, to, to dominate where they are now. And that's something they felt like they marked. And they just, I, I do like the idea of this uh, this sea world being like a timeline of maybe life or maybe timeline of, uh, of what's going on. 
Um, they are telling us their history through imagery. And I like that because sometimes imagery can really, really help um, know what's going on in their perspectives. And it shows that this was a, a, um, a very violent war from both sides. Um, one side being very heavily um, armed with the helmets and um, a, a lot of uh, weaponry, whereas uh, the, the picks are seen here uh, to just have their horses and the basic equipment, but they uh, pulled through. And I think that's just highlight highlighting how important they are in terms of being strong because they fought without helmets, helmets. They're showing off their long hair. They're giving us their identity through this image. <clears throat> and th this, this, this side here, so, this, oh, where's the pen gone? Oh, bloody hell, bloody pen. Will you come back, please? What are you doing to me? Um, oh, hang on a minute. Maybe if I go back. Technology is going to be the death of me, I think. Um, so this side here is thought to be the Pictish people. So you can see their, their long hair in, uh, in their faces. Um, and then you see these uh, group of other people who have helmets. And I think that's also making a statement in itself that look at us, we're people that have just gone out there with uh, whatever we had. We didn't have these helmets now and we still beat them because we're strong. And um, it's making a statement of how powerful they are, really. And so it's not just telling us a story of what happened. It's giving us a warning, I think, to anyone else that, look, if we can beat them, we'll beat you. Um, and it doesn't really take much for us to beat you as well. So I, I, I do like this. Um, and then you get to this amazing other stone as well. Um, now someone said, oh, um, there's not many women depicted in this. And um, no, there's not many women depicted in um, a lot of these Pictish symbols, but you do find the odd one. So um, you can't say that, 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 that they're uh, not being sort of represented really. But this is quite interesting. So this one is um, the Maiden Stone in Amber Aberdeen again. And this is what they think it would look like in colour. So again, you're seeing this, um, this cross coming into play here um, with a lot of their um, intertwining knots here. And it, it, it does look very Celtic. You've got some here looking very angular. And then you've got some here looking very rounded. And you've got this, um, this beautiful cross. And they're showing them merging. Like I said, um, you have, you, you, like I said, sometimes clashing of ideas work, and that's what they felt like. These opposite, opposites are attracting their um, religion with the Christian religion worked well for them. And I think these also stood as ways of um, maybe preaching. Now, someone said this is um, like a, um, a maiden is uh, telling us the story here, and I do think that's a very nice interpretation, really, of it all. Oh, where's my pen gone? Right, I can't find my pen, but we'll, we'll have to do without said pen now. Um, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, it's saying my screen sharing's paused, so maybe if I resume sharing. Oh gosh, what's going on? No, I don't know what's, what I've done here. Hang on a minute. If I get rid of that, stop sharing, go back to share. Oh! And what is going on here? If you say bugger bugger, it might help. Yeah, oh, okay. And now we're saying it's not working. Well, I'll, kick, I'll kick it. <laughs> um, hang on a minute, you'll have to bear with me. I think I've uh, got rid of it by accident, so I'll get it back up. Oh, Bill, I think I might uh, punch the screen in by the end of the day. Um, I've got it up here. So if I share screen again, I apologize for this, guys. Me and technology are not friends. Uh, well, I, I, I hate very, it whenever. Very, very patient, Jess. I'd be swearing by now. Oh, Bill, you, you don't know what's going on in my head, the inner, <laughs> the inner dialogue. Um, You're swearing in your head, yeah, that's fine. And godly words. Um, yes, so um, here we are here. Um, so they're saying that this is representing a, a maiden, and I, I, and I agree with that. Um, some people have said that maybe this is a preacher. Um, but there's been a little story behind this stone as well, um, in terms of that uh, woman, was that she was a woman that um, that upset um, a god, or maybe um, a, a type of god, um, 
and she she was forever put into the stone. Another story that I had read, if I can find it, was that she um, had a bet with uh, the devil, and she said to the devil um, that she could um, she could uh, throw a stone faster than he could uh, build a, a road. Where is it? And he said, "All right, okay." Legend says it that there was a woman that turned to stone after losing a wager with the devil, and that she could take a but she could bake bannocks faster than he could build a road to uh, Miver um, Top, um, which is a summit on the hill um, near Inverary. Inver um, however, um, that didn't happen and she was forever put into stone. So that's quite an interesting interpretation here, because like I said, things like this, if people don't know, they put the legends in with it. But one thing I think is quite interesting is that we're merging these these beliefs and these legends together with the Christian cross. And this woman is, um, whether she is a preacher that's telling us about the Christian religion and they felt like she was important or whether she was someone that was turned into stone, but she's um, surrounded by, it looks like these eel sort of things, um, these the, these eel snake things as well, which again, they're keeping true to their um, symbolism of keeping the animals that they have in their environment with them um, next to the Christian symbols. And I, I just think, it's, again, it's just so detailed and so beautiful, but um, yeah, they did have women in their stones. I don't think we found enough stones to know whether women were a very common thing in their um, stones, but I think this is a start really. Um, and I think it's very important to understand what is going on here because you see in this shift there's a lot less symbolism in terms of mythical creatures and scary beasts um, and we're starting to see the Christian symbol being in the middle around this beautiful decoration they're keeping their culture and their identity there in terms of the knots and the intertwining of all these beautiful um, swirls but they've kept an identity of an individual on the top whether that was someone who was there preaching I or whether that was a maiden who uh, lost a wager, sadly. Um, but again, it's, it's like it still has this religious meaning, but is surrounded by the, um, the, the Christian beliefs. And like I said, they complement each other, really. And I think that's what made people, um, the Pictish people, relate to Christianity, because they were able to merge it into their culture and make it their own as well, and make it part of their identity as much. Um, this is also something else. This is a, an interpretation panel by um, Historic Environment Scotland. And th this is just how they're showing um, all this. They talk about this forgotten language, um, how the, these patterns are showing um, the Pictish names and um, how they uh, had written. Um, but you're also seeing here um, that, that they... Um, that they have place names as well um, into this. So people think that different symbols shows different um, uh, place names and origins. But then you're also seeing um, Christian symbols mixed in with the, the, the animals. And I think it just shows really how they're mixing this in with their culture and making it one, of, uh, one, one with them. Um, hang on a minute, let me just sort out the dogs. about that right okay so um it's nice that they're sort of delving deep into this and it letting people have knowledge of um what is being able to be accessible to everyone um so they're putting it out there they want people to know about this and i think they're putting it out there to get people to have better interpretations as well which i it makes me very very happy but again here's some more recreations that we have and this is more of um religious. This is the Dunfanflandi stone, um, which is in Highland, in one of the Highlands. So um, on the front of it, you're seeing this Pictish symbolism of the animals and the people. And then on the back of it, you're having this um, religious symbolism of um, priests and um, the religious elite, I would call them, the, the ones that 
they're in control of uh, the religion, but they're putting them in there with um, uh, objects that they relate to as well. Um, and also um, just how this fits in with them, really. I think it just shows it was a nice ending to it all that they're still mixing Christianity Christianity here isn't very oppressive, it isn't a race in their culture, it's mixing in with their culture and complementing them. And I think that's just something that's important to note because they took Christianity as part of their identity as much as they saw their mythical creatures and the animals around them as their identity. Um, and I think here we're showing, they're showing us the people that possibly would have influenced them in terms of their Christianity and how they felt so indebted to them that they put them into their stones and their art really which is which is amazing and I think that it's, it's nice and I think one thing is is that it's not conclusive but sometimes having things like this to let your mind run wild and read them is amazing one thing I just sort of realized here is um this creature on the bottom it looks like um like a fish thing but it looks like he's got legs sticking out of his mouth so um, they, they're showing you these monsters still and all the different types of animals, maybe like um, like a, a, a fox or a wolf there and uh, other animals, the, the, the deer, um, something that they interact with daily in society. And then on the other side, then they're showing us how they've moved forward, how they've developed as a society in terms of their belief and what else they've taken on and what else they identify as and what is important to them. They're still keeping the tools that they have in society is important because I think that just shows to us that these are the tools for their development. These are the tools that have helped bring them to where they are today. And to me, they're just marking down things of importance of their history, their victories, the, the, the way they're changing religion, their way of thinking, the animals around them. And ultimately, I think it, it, it just sort of brings us closer to how they saw the world and how they fitted in with this change to Christianity to the, in the medieval period. So the early medieval period, they're showing it through a different type of illumination. We do see illuminations of loads of things, um, and sometimes, uh, one thing I'll say with manuscript studies is that sometimes um, you look at colours, so they can have people coloured in blue, which is a very expensive colour, yeah. and that tells us something, that they thought of them as foreign people. And so colour can give you a new interpreted interpretation, an added interpretation, and gives us one step closer to what they're trying to tell us. So the colour and the drawings together is what they're talking to us that's their language and I think it's given us a nice story of their victories it's given us a nice story of their um the animals around them their beliefs that the, the tools they used and who they've been influenced by um by the end of their uh, period as well in terms of their religion so um that's the end of that so I want to say thank you so I'll ask um dad is there anything that you'd like to ask or add Oh, I really enjoyed that, even though Carl has put my, altered my name to huge reaction. Uh, <laughs> he's naughty. I'll forgive him, I'll forgive him. But no, um, yeah, that last picture, the cross with the animals, I'm wondering if they are meant to represent the apostles. Because I know... Oh, I yeah. The Apostle James was known as the camel because he spent so much time on his knees. His knees were, ca were calloused, like a mm. camel's knees. And a couple of others, I think, got yeah. sort of references to various animals. Obviously, there was a lamb on there, which was obviously Jesus. But if we went, if there was a, more of it at the mm -hmm. bottom, there may be another two or three animals. <coughs> So I'm wondering if it's the animals were sort yeah. of a lesson, right? These are the apostles, these are the animals they represent, and a sort of crossover, if you know what I mean. From yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's a good idea. They're, 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 to help they're... people understand, because of course people wouldn't have read Latin, no. Greek or Hebrew, mm. Aramaic, but show them a picture. They know. It's like all yeah. the painted um, churches. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. The reason they were so decorated was to help people understand the gospel messages at the time. 
And it wasn't just yeah. sort of, oh, we'll just paint that wall and we'll put something nice on. It was to teach a lesson because people couldn't read. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I I'm think wondering that, that, if that, that is a way of... Yeah, I'm wondering if some, some of these things on these, not just crosses, but other stuff, are basically pictograms representing stories, myths, legends, important messages yeah. for the local people. Yeah. Rather than just random, oh, we put an eagle What's on you, or we'll put this thing on you. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you, Del. That's me, um, Dan. Is that right? Bill, anything you'd like to ask or add? Um, the, 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 um, the markings on these stones, they seem to be a mix of Christian and pagan. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting to know whether those carvings are contemporary with each other or whether they put on a different time. And one technique which may have been used already is this um, surface luminescent testing which shows that um, when, gives a date of when the, the, the specimen on the stone was first exposed to light. Yeah. So if that was uh, done on, as an experiment, you might have already. Would yeah. that indicate that maybe the Christian symbols obviously came on later than the pagan, which is what we believe, you know? I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, how would that help? But I'm sure they've used different techniques to try to do that sort of thing in, in their interpretation. No. Yeah, they, they have found with uh, some of the stones that the Christian and the Pictish uh, symbolism are contemporary to each other. Yeah, so yeah, it seems yeah. like it, it's that merging, that development it's in the their belief and culture. Yeah. 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 No, thank you, Bill. Um, Anne, anything you'd like to ask or add? No, that's uh, that's very interesting follow on really from um, a picture with the lesson we had with Carl. Yeah. So and um, it's just new developments, you know, which is great because it will give us more information and uh, we we'll learn more about them. So that's good. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you, Anne. Oh. Thank you. Um, Pat, anything you'd like to ask or add? No, I just thought they were quite colourful and very pretty. Kind of reminded me of these statues they painted of the Greeks, you know. Yeah. Quite bright. I, I got a grandson downstairs, so I'm going to pop off now. So. Yeah, no, it's okay, I'll, Pat. I'll thank you for joining. Day. I'll see you soon. Take You're care. Awesome. Okay, bye. Um, Henry, you'd like to ask or add anything? Um, I was just saying. Because of the Book of Kells, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, obviously around the 800s, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if any cross Susan has been looked at with the Pictish symbols and what could appear in there. Yeah, just as yeah. a thought. Yeah, no, I, I think yeah, I, I think that would be quite an interesting thing to look into and delve oh. deeper into. Oh yeah. They're like contemporary, aren't they, with each mm. other, really? You know, is it, you wonder if they do get influenced by, mm -hmm. by each other. I've got to go. I can smell something burning. It's OK, Del. Uh, yeah, Del, no, uh, Del, are you going to get this thing set up for us, then? What thing? You know, the, 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 this, this subcommittee about the, the development in Lalliston. Yes, I'll try and sort that out. Yeah, try try and get a honcho to work with this. But Bill, Bill Bill will be delighted to help with that one. I'll just to volunteer him. Right, lovely, <laughs> lovely. I've got it written down. I've just got to find the time to do it. All right, Lovely. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, no, I think it's it's, it's an interesting one, and I think we're going to be getting more and more information as things go on. But I think one thing that is important to this is how we're seeing the um, effect of other influences in terms of civilizations and beliefs and other people in terms of this. And they're, they're telling their story of how that's influenced <laughs> them and allowed them to develop as a culture. Um, I'm putting an article here. Um, like I said, it's open access online, so you don't have to pay for anything. Um, it is an academic article, but um, very interesting. So I'll put the name of it here. Um, if that's the, the name of it, um, I've given the article 
name the Royal Society Publishing and the name of the article as well. So that's gone into a, a lot of technical stuff and gone into a lot of things that we talked about as well, especially talking about the symbolism and what they could have meant as well. So uh, thank you everyone for that. I'll leave you with Carl. And ah, thanks very much, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. Are you settled in? I don't expect you are, but you, you've moved, haven't you? Goodbye, goodbye. Is Me? It goodbye? No, I haven't moved yet, and I haven't got any Wi-Fi for a couple of days, so I'm staying at my nan's to uh, teach. Okay, okay. All the best, anyway. Yeah, I was just about to mention, Bill, are you, are you coming on Monday, then? Um, 90% yes. All, all right, then. And Anne, you want to come along to the trip to your uh, to Chester, yeah? 90%. <laughs> oh, this is a nightmare. And uh, obviously, uh, obviously, the main thing is to try and um, uh, 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 it was raised to me about from somebody in Lantwit about this, these fields. And I just thought, well, you know, we, 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 oh. we're, we're, we're over capacity as it is. So um, oh. it, it would be good if somebody looked at those fields at Lalliston. Um, and uh, yes, it, it's, it's where mm. we need to go. So anyone want to ask me anything before Jessica closes? Is it same place, same time next week? Yeah. Online? Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. It is. We're not it, it we yeah. won't be do, there it there are the Bridgend County County Council public toilets you could use for a meeting, but uh <laughs> oh. okay. I gotta go. I'm going. Yeah, On that I'm note, yeah. take care, guys. Jessica, <laughs> close the meeting. Okay. Bye. Yeah, thank you all. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, then. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 No, I was only going to say, um, it's all yeah, gone I mean, that's the other alternative. I was thinking, you know, couldn't we go in, uh, you know, no, not not the church halls. Can't we go in a church? See you, Henry. Bye, Henry. Bye. Bye, bye, Henry. <laughs> Bye bye. Bye bye. I can hear your turkey, Carl. Yeah, I know he's turkey. Oh, anyway, no. uh, actually, actually, <laughs> he wants um, the attention he deserves. He, 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 oh. he does want attention. He's going to come out with me in the garden and lay some more turf. Mm. Um, yeah. So, look, why, why don't why don't why don't you on a seventeenth, right? You got that little plot at the top of Newcastle. If it's a nice day, why don't you have an outdoor do? Well, yeah. does, uh, does, oh, you mean with Jessica? Yeah, there's no reason why you can't sit in the graveyard on the gravestones having a class. I've done it. <laughs> well, listen, I, it, we'll see. We'll see. And does it seem fast? We might as well go in Knowlton Church, can't, you know, or go in the castle. No. Well, I just just a, just an idea. Like, yeah, it's true. Yeah. All right. Well, then. Anyway, Anne, I'll see you soon. See what the weather's like. Bye. Take care, Ron. I, I think that guy behind me's got. I think if you do that, my nose is bigger than his. Uh, I, I think me, I think me and him could have a good conversation about nose sizes. Oh gosh, what, 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 what is that? Where's that? Um, I've seen that image before, but what, what people is it? That's the Aboriginal lecture. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's it. That's how, what I remember it from. And I had I had an Aboriginal contact con, contact me on the video the other day that we made of that, and he, he was very complimentary. Oh, that's great! I like that. It's so, amazing. So that's good. So um, yeah. yeah. So if you haven't got any other news, I'm gonna. Uh, no, I'm gonna go and get in on uh, quickly sending off a few things to you, and then I'm gonna go and screen for a little bit after this whole Wi-Fi incident. I don't know if you can see on Twitter, but I've been harassing Talk Talk non-stop because I've just realised that just certain aspects it's not just sort of work as well in terms of uh, education and um counseling and things like that it's not accessible now at all and they seem to think oh it's five days is okay but it's five days every now and then and you can't you can't do that at all and uh, i'm just having made of them i keep saying i'm reporting them to ofcom Are you, uh, i'm a force to be reckoned with carl so you you've contact you contacted them about um, you, you, yeah you've... I've just said that it's it's not acceptable when a lot of us rely on it really so um and they keep saying message us and I said I've messaged you I've called you 
as I've reinstated in many of my messages to you, and your bow is useful as a chocolate teapot, so a chocolate fire guard as well. <laughs> <laughs> Useless. Anyway, Carl, um, I'll uh, leave you be, and I'll speak to you later. I'm going to join the turkey in a garden. We're going to lay, lay some more turf. Nice. Enjoy it in the sun. Okay, we'll, we'll see you soon. Enjoy. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Closing this now. Thanks for joining us.